Hi, everybody. Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Hermes and its lawsuit, but also Hermes and its Birkins and Kellys. Somebody out there apparently developed a formula how to se securely secure yourself a Birkin and take it home from the Hermes store. How is this connected to the lawsuit? Let's find out together. First, subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today. Gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Decabal spelled together there as well for extra perks. Thank you to my members and patrons who already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week, so come join the fun and come join the chats. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. Thumb up the video if you're enjoying it as we hit that Hermes shame. Shame. This is the frisbee of shame. Okay. Now listen, Linda. Several years ago, a young gentleman by the name of Michael Tonello wrote a book about how he about his experience as how he managed to create a formula to always get you a Birkin. Now, I'm going to post a link to this book in the description box underneath this video. It is a link to Amazon, so it is an affiliate link. If you wish to purchase the book, it's not going to cost you more, but I think a couple of cents <laughs> from the sales of the book might go to me. So thank you for your support. <laughs> And also, I want to thank Holly Grace for uh, sending me over this video interview that I watched. So, Holly, you know, you know, IYK, YK. So, this is what will go, will go. Uh, Mr. Michael Tonello wrote a book called Bringing Home the Birkin. Not the bacon. I added that part. <laughs> Bringing Home the Birkin. And I wonder, and here's my theory, can this book which was issued several years ago, and it keeps getting reissued. Could this book potentially be utilized against Hermes in the lawsuit that is kind of building up in California? Hmm. Anike in the chat says, oh, wow, I remember that book. Listen, Linda. So Michael's story, let me just quickly uh, tell you how this came to be. So he's a gentleman who's been living in the States and had no clue about Hermes, Birkins or whatever. He was, I don't even know what he was doing, but somewhere in the 90s, he uh, was going, to, he was living in New York, I believe, or some other city. And he was going to some gala event and he bought at Hermes, quick, no, Bergdorf Goodman's or another one of those shopping places, high-end, that also sold Hermes stuff, and he bought an Hermes scarf or tie in silk, wore it for that one red carpet event or gala, and then took it off the next morning, put it back in its box, forgot about it. Several years later, he moved to another city, and as he was unpacking, he found that Hermes silk item which he had no use for anymore. And then he says in this interview uh, that I watched on YouTube, he says, you know, I listed it on eBay and uh, because I didn't need it anymore. And it just, you know, maybe somebody else would like it. And he was surprised. So he says that the silk item sold for more than what he paid for it originally. And then he realized really quickly as an entrepreneurial American would, it's all about the money, honey. He realized pretty soon, oh, wow, there's not many, this is in the 90s, there's not many Hermes boutiques in America. And a lot of people that have money and want Hermes do not live in a city where there is a boutique. So he started selling on secondhand websites, Hermes silk scarves, foulards, carrés. And he would always sell them at a profit. So he would keep going back to Hermes, buying a bunch of them, and then reselling. I guess back then there was no reseller ban. <laughs> they weren't really on to him, apparently, allegedly. Of course, everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged, just my opinion. 
So then he said that at one point, somebody, uh, kind of news spread of this guy who was the Hermes silk whisperer. <laughs> and then somebody asked him at one point, hey, I have a client, a famous actress or actor, I don't know, wants a Birkin, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he's like, oh, what's a Birkin? Like, apparently he didn't even know what it was, didn't even care. So he said, yeah, sure, I'll try to get a Birkin. So he goes to Hermes and says, enters Hermes and asks for a Birkin. And they look at him like, no, they, we don't have a Birkin. And there's a waiting list for a Birkin. You know, Samantha Jones in Sex in the City in that episode where, you know, with Lucy Liu and the whole shebang happens, you know, very Samantha Jones moment. So he enters Hermes, asks for a Birkin. They're like, no. There's a waiting list. Then he found out later on that in some Hermes boutiques, there's a waiting list to get on the waiting list for a Birkin. And he said none of the Hermes boutiques in which he put his name down on the waiting list, none of those boutiques ever called him back in all of these decades that have passed since he started shopping there. But he said that at one point... He started traveling a lot all over Europe, America, South America. Like he mentioned many cities he went to uh, where there were Hermes boutiques. And he said he would always enter every Hermes boutique uh, that he would encounter. Uh, and he would always ask for a Birkin. Nobody would have a Birkin. They would always say no, 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 no. Until one day. He said he uh, had a list of uh, products that were ordered by some people that were, you know, requesting him to buy stuff for them. And they were mostly silk scarves, carrés, foulards. And so he entered an Hermes boutique and asked the sales associate. He had a list of things he needed. And they checked off of the list almost everything he wanted. So we're talking, I don't know, 10 scarves, more or less, so they're all in their separate boxes. So you can imagine they're all piled up, you know. And the sales associate is walking towards the cash register with the silk scarves. And he said, just as an afterthought, he didn't even think about it. Like, it wasn't strategical or anything in that moment. He just said to the sales associate, while the sales associate was about to ring up all those scarves and make him pay, a lot of money for them. He said, hey, um, do you by any chance happen to have a Birkin? The sales associates stopped in their feet and said, let me check in the back. And just like that, he thought he figured out the formula of how to get a Birkin. And in fact, the sales associate went into the back, came back to the front, with a huge orange box, took him to the side, lifted the lid, put the gloves on, took the Birkin out. He's like, yeah, great, wrap it up together with the scarves. Little did he know that the Birkin was crocodile. So they charged him back then, he said, $20,000 for it. And he didn't have that money on the credit card. So the credit card would have given him three weeks before they charged the money back. So he was panic moding. Because he's like, oh, my God, I need to find somebody to buy this Birkin off me because I need to pay back my credit card bill immediately. And that's where this star came into play, uh, that famous person that uh, wanted a Birkin. So he contacted the contact of the, of the famous person and said, hey, I got a Birkin, I got a crocodile. And since he didn't know how rare they were, he said that his first Birkin sale, he didn't mark up the price a lot. He said he only marked it up by $5,000, which now he regrets. But then he says, thankfully, all ended up great because by marking it up so low, he delivered personally the Birkin to the star, to the famous person at the Ritz, apparently. And they became close because that star thought that he was not ripping them off. So the star started trusting him, and that famous person then opened up new doors for new clients for him. So he said he thought that maybe one of these silk scarves was a code. Like, is maybe one of the silk, like, do you have to purchase one particular silk scarf to unlock 
<laughs> the Birkin. So he had no clue. So the second Hermes boutique after the Birkin purchase that he went to, he says he literally took the same list with him uh, of scarves that he bought when he got offered the first Birkin offered again. When he got a lot, when he was allowed to purchase the first Birkin. So he says in the interview, he gave the same list of scarves to the new sales associate, tuck, 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 as they were walking towards the cash register, sales associate with all the scarves. He's like, uh, do you happen to have a Birkin as well as all of these other items that I'm just about to purchase? And lo and behold, the sales associate stops in their feet and says, let me check in the back. And lo and behold, just like that, sooner than later, they come out with an orange box and he gets a Birkin. So that's the strategy he started implementing and kept doing over and over and over and over again. Now, mind you, he's not a Birkin collector. He's a reseller. And he started building up his profile, started building up relationships to the sales associates, and also started building up relationships to the clients that he was selling these items to, to the point where he decided to write a book, which is the book we're talking about here. A link to the book down below. Get it on Amazon now. <laughs> and he said the book was really popular when it was first released many years ago. By that time, he stopped purchasing at Hermes and reselling, like he got money elsewhere. He didn't have to do the reselling shtick anymore to survive, right? Because he said in the interview that he, with all the reseller gig he was doing with Hermes, like he made millions flow. And I'm like, wow. And so he said when the book came out, it was successful and Hermes took note and he said apparently he got intel that Hermes CEOs and higher ups sent an email, or back in the day was also fax, with the title of the book, with an email stating to all the sales associates, whoever enters the boutique and talks about the book, make it clear that the book was not written by Hermes. The book is not associated with the brand Hermes. We have nothing to do with this book. This is not how you can get a Birkin by, do it, by following these steps. And he thought he was blacklisted on top of that. Now, fast forward many years later, in this interview he says, one of the contacts that he had was frustrated because their client really wanted a Birkin and it was some famous person again and they could not get a Birkin ever. Every time they tried, they could not. And so they wanted to call in a favor and say, hey, can you please get back into the resale business just this one time and try to get a Birkin for my client? And he said, I haven't done it in like 10, 20 years now. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't think so because rules and regulations change. All of their, you know, the sales associates have changed. The higher ups that work there have changed. It's probably going to be a totally different structure by now. They might have a different way of deciding who gets the bag or not. He's like, but you know what? Let me try. It doesn't cost anything to go and try. So in the interview, what was shocking to me is he said, and this happened just a short while ago. He said, I went into Hermes. I bought a ton of scarves, small leather goods or whatever. As we were going to the cash register to pay, I stopped and said to the sales associate, do you happen to also have a Birkin? Sales associate stopped, said, let me check in the back and let me talk to the store manager. But lo and behold, they came back with a Birkin. <laughs> Now, why do I think that this book could be used in the lawsuit? Because if he has any way of proving all that he writes in his book, if they were to call him as a witness, as a professional witness because he's a published author, blah, 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 self-proclaimed reseller, if his testimony were to prove that all of those Hermes boutiques 
were telling him no Birkin, no Birkin, up until the moment when he started purchasing a ton of side products, scarves and blah, blah, blah. And before he pays them, he says, before I pay, first, do you have a Birkin? And then the Birkin magically appears. I mean, if I were in that jury, I would have a few things to think about before I would give my jury duty vote to Hermes as opposed to the people who are claiming that Hermes wants you to buy something else before they allow you to buy the Birkin and the Kelly. Very, very interesting. Now, this book is fascinating. If you were to rewind several years back on my channel, and we're talking 2016, 2017, I have spoken about, not the book because I didn't know about the book, but I've spoken about this strategy already. Uh, it's something that has been kind of known uh, in the luxury community, especially if you're shopping in Europe and you were to purchase a ton of things. But right before you pay them, you ask, like, do you also have a Birkin or a Kelly? They might just offer you to buy one, offer you again the wrong. I'm indoctrinated, not offer you. They might allow you to buy one. Uh, and this was the case back in the day. Now in Europe, they've changed the rules quite a bit because you have to make a wish appointment, but they're making it very clear in Europe because they don't want to get sued. They say in Europe, everybody can write an email to Hermes to ask for a wish appointment regardless from their purchase history. And if Hermes has an open slot for a wish appointment within 30 days of your asking for the wish appointment, then you will be granted a wish appointment. At the wish appointment, you ask for the bag you would like, and then Hermes takes up to one year, one and a half years to fulfill that wish, and then you pay the bag when the bag arrives. <coughs> Esclo, pardon me, I'm still recovering from the cold. As close as possible to the specifications that you've given them at your wish appointment. But how to bypass all of that, according to this gentleman who wrote this book, he says you can bypass all of that by purchasing a ton of stuff that day, and before you pay it, you ask for the Birkin. Now, my question to you guys is, do you think that this could be used in this book could be used in the lawsuit and his testimony could be used in the lawsuit as the witness to the prosecution? A and B. And then C, would you ever do the following? Tell your... Tell the, enter a random Hermes boutique, tell the sales associate, I want uh, this carré, this scarf, this foulard, that pair of shoes, I want uh, these earrings, I want that bracelet. And you're walking towards the cash register with all this stuff and then the sales associate worked, folded everything together, they put everything in the boxes and before you pay, you ask for a Birkin. If they say we don't have one, here's my question to you. If they say in that moment, no, sorry, we don't have one, would you then tell them, oh, really? Okay, sorry, my bad. Then, you know what? I changed my mind. I don't want to purchase all these things. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah, no, I miscalculate. And I, you know what? I actually don't need any of these. Th thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Would you do that or would you be too embarrassed and you would like still pay for the stuff without getting the ver Like, what would you will go, will go? Kev is like, Michael Tonello to the stand, right? Shani D says, Hermes is probably deleting his account as we speak, honey. Rizology says, yes, I would. Shani says, yes, sorry. I would also say no to pur the purchase. <laughs> MJMJ says, yes, sorry. I will cancel my purchases. Janie says, that would be savage. Gigi Luna just wrote, I would only get the bag. Imagine you're, all that stuff piled up at the cash register, scarves, shoes, da, 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 da. And then you say, do you also have a Birkin? They say, yeah. Then they bring out the Birkin. And then you say, oh, you got the Birkin? How much is it? They tell you the price. And then you say, you know what? It's really expensive. 
So let me just get the Birkin. I'm not going to get the scarves and the other stuff. I'll just, just ring up the Birkin. That would be a great way to prove in the lawsuit that Hermes doesn't want to sell you the Birkin if you don't buy the other stuff. Because, because could you imagine? Could you imagine pulling this stunt at Hermes and telling them, oh, wait, hold on a minute. I actually don't want to, don't want to buy the scarves anymore. I just want the Birkin now because you obviously have it. You just showed it to me. You're offering to me to buy it. And imagine the Hermes sales associate then telling you, oh, sorry, we cannot sell you the Birkin if you don't buy these other things. Well, then, bam, then you would have the proof that they are indeed pushing these parallel extras. Oh, somebody needs to take some candid camera into one of these stows and get him and get him good because that would be a good moment indeed. Take those, yes, Shani D, put that, take, wear those glasses with the camera in. <laughs> Case closed, honey. Let me know your thoughts and prayers down below. What do you think? Should we do it? Ooh! Should we do it or don't do it? Let me know your thoughts and prayers down below. Subscribe, get the book through the link down below. Never give up on love. Bye.